Well, Forefront, how's it going this morning? How you guys doing? Good, good. Hey, if you guys are new here, my name is Drew, and I'm the lead pastor here, and we're just so glad that you guys are spending your Sunday morning with us today. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, grab those, and let's open up to the book of Romans. And we'll be in chapter 15 for most of our time this morning. Well, if you last week, we um, kicked off a, a vision series for 2020 called Vision 2020. We talked about how we have a bright faith and a bold future as a church. And so we started really talking about what God, is, is, who God is calling us to be, where he's calling us to go, and how we're going to accomplish this together. And last week, we made two really amazing announcements. We welcomed a new elder to our elder team. Pete McKean joined the team, so we're super excited about Pete on the team. And also, we announced last week that a special new partnership that is launching in March with a Hispanic-only speaking church, or Spanish-only speaking church uh, called uh, Iglesia Vida Abundante, Abundant Life Church. And so starting March 1st, we're going to begin holding Spanish-only services here at Forefront at 1145. AM. So that's going to be really cool. Excited for how God's going to use our building and this campus to reach this neighborhood uh, with, for the gospel. So super excited about that. Um, and so last week we talked about this mission, this vision we have as a church. Good? All right, good. I got my apparel crew out here keeping me straight. That's good. Thank you. I need that. I need that. I was trying a new look, but it wasn't working. So we kicked off last week this idea that we as a church are on a mission and that we have a vision. And we said that it's a lot like a map. Think about pulling out Google Maps or Waze on your phone. And if you're going somewhere, say you're going on vacation, you have a final destination. So you pull up your map and you punch in your final destination. That's where you're going. That's where your final destination is. That's our mission as a church. But we said also that as a church, we have a vision. And that vision is how you get there. It's what you're doing on the way. Think of it as kind of where you spend the night as you go. So we said that our mission as a church is to help people find their way back to God. And we have this God-sized mission that he has given us at this church. And we're so excited about that. But then as we talked last week, we said that you know, we have been praying about what is this vision that God is giving us? Who is he calling us to be? Where is he calling us to go? How do we get to this final destination? So last week we announced that we had a brand new vision statement, but I left you guys hanging on that, if you remember. I left you with a cliffhanger. So I know you guys have all been on the edge of your seat all week waiting for this. So I'm excited to reveal it to you. For months, as elders and leaders here, we've been praying about what is our vision as a church? And uh, I'm, I'm excited to share this with you today. Nobody's seen this except for a couple, except for our elders and a few leaders and some people on our creative team. So here it is. Here is our vision as a church. Feel free to write it down or we'll blast it out later on social media. But here's our vision. Here's where we're going. Think of this as the stop on the map on the way to the final destination. Here it is. Our vision is to advance a Jesus-focused movement in our community that changes lives, that restores hope, and builds Christ-centered relationships. So this is our vision. This is who we are. This is who God's calling us to be. To be a church that is advancing a Jesus-focused movement. Now, we talked about using the word gospel there, and gospel would have been great. But we want to be super crystal clear on what our vision is as a church. And our vision is we are Jesus-focused. Amen, church? Jesus-focused, and we're taking this focus to our community. And, our, and, and the, the hope of this vision is to change lives, restore hope, and build Christ-centered relationships. So you guys are going to see this plastered all over everything. Uh, moving forward, but we're really excited about this vision that God has given us. Now, you might read that and wonder, what, is, what do we mean by community? And this is why I love the word community, because community can be as big as you want it to be, and it can be as small as you want it to be. So if I asked you, what is your community, what would you say? Somebody throw something out. What's your community? Family, Family neighborhood, what else? A couple more. World, church, yeah, okay, good, friends. So think about community, this idea. Community can be as small as family. It can be as small as friends. It can be as small as, say, a Bible study or your life group, right? That's your community, and that's great. And we want to bring change and hope, and we want to build that community on Christ. But also, as you see, as, as some of the answers we had there, community can be as big as, as world, right? So some of us, we think, okay, well, our community, where the church is located is Harvey Park. We want to bring change, hope, and build Christ-centered relationships in Harvey Park. 
Somebody might say, well, it's Denver, metro area. We said last week that there are 3 million people in this, in this metro area and probably about 2.5 million of those people either don't know Jesus, don't go to a church that teaches about Jesus, or are unengaged from church, have just decided to step away. And so we want to bring change and hope and build relationships in Denver. Somebody else might say the Front Range, Colorado. From, say, Colorado Springs to, you know, name it, right? Somewhere up north, Loveland. That's our community. Okay, great. Well, we want to bring hope and we want to bring change and we want to build relationships by planting churches up and down the, the Front Range, by sending out teams to bring hope in our city. So this is our vision. And yes, it's a big vision. It's a God-sized vision. But it's the, build, it's the vision that, co- that God has called us to be. So this community can be as big and as small as you want to frame it. And the answer to all of those questions is yes. That community want to bring hope and change and relationships. So this is our vision. This is what God's calling us to do. And as we've been uh, praying about this vision and where God is calling us, I've, asked, I've also been asking God to give me a word that ties it all together. To give, give me a word for 2020 that we can hang on to, that will push us forward, that will bring us together on this vision. And, and as, we, as we put this vision together, one thing kept becoming abundantly clear is that at the heart of this vision is relationship. Right? At the heart of, of hope and change, it, it, Christ-centered relationship, it's just this idea that we are in relationship together. So as I've been praying for this word, God has given me clarity for this idea of relationship. And here's our word for 2020. Write this down, guys. Here's our word. It's connect. Somebody say connect. 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 So our word for 2020 is connect. Because if you think about relationships, every, almost every relationship in your life has come together because of a connection. Because somebody has connected you. Think of your, your, your spouse, right? It, really good chance are that, that you were connected through a friend, through church, maybe it was an online dating service, whatever it may be, you were connected together. Think about your friendships, right? Those friendships, you got connected. Maybe it was school that connected you, or it was church, or it was a friend of a friend. Relationships begin with connection. And so this is what God is calling us to do. He's given us this God-sized vision, and He said, I want you as a church, Forefront Church, to connect others into this vision so that we can deliver on our mission. So connect is going to be our word for 2020. This idea that we're going to connect together as a church, we're going to connect hope to this community, and we're going to connect deeper with Jesus. And so this morning I want to spend our time and camp out in Romans chapter 15. Because in Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul paints this picture for us of what it looks like to be a connecting church. To be a church that connects centered on Jesus Christ and a church that brings change and hope and relationship. So if you have your Bibles, flip with me to Romans 15. And I want us to see how God is going to connect us into this vision and bring us all together. But as you turn there, before we dig in, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for just the the chance to come into these rooms today as the church to sing these songs and have our hearts changed and poured into and, and Lord, to focus our eyes on you and your grace. Father, we just thank you so much for uh, the fact that we can come together united as a church with this vision to take your world outside these walls. Um, And as we go out today with Saturate, I pray that you just go before us and you prepare hearts and you open doors for your gospel to move. Father, this morning we want to lift up the Smith family, uh, Rebecca and Brian and Ani and Cody, as Brian's father Richard um, passed away this week. And so, Lord, we, we love the Smith family so much, and we just pray that you unite them together during this really, really tough time. And, uh, Lord, help them to know that you're with them in this valley, and that you're walking alongside them, and that you're going to give them courage and, and peace. So, Father, we pray that you go before them. Father, at the same time, we are extremely excited to look out in the crowd today and see Emily and Zach Tetro with us this morning. And Father, it just what, a, what a, uh, an example of your faithfulness of how you've walked with Emily and Zach through such a challenging past few months. And we love them so much and are just so excited for what you're doing in their lives and excited for where you're going to take them from here. And, uh, and so we can't be more happy just to, that they're with us this morning. Father, give us wisdom as we look at your word. Help us to see that you are uh, the way maker that you have connected us together for a purpose. And Lord, I pray that you fill us up while we're here today and that when we leave today, we are more like Jesus than when we came. And it's in Jesus' strong name that we pray. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. So Romans chapter 15. We've got a huge chunk of scripture we're going to cover today, but we're going to take it in bite-sized pieces. Sound good? So this book of Romans is an amazing book. If you've spent any time in the book of Romans, you know that this is a book full of deep theology and God's truth. Paul talks about how we're justified by by faith. It's not not our actions, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, but because of Jesus, we can have right relationship with him. He talks about who we are as a church and how he's gifted you and you and you and you and me and all of us together to be the church and how to live that out. But there's one theme that runs throughout this entire book that, we, that once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's this idea of racial, racial reconciliation. And so Paul is writing so much in this about justification and theology and, and deep doctrine, but yet he's also telling us that we need to focus on racial reconciliation and the fact that we were once all different people and now we're brought together as one in the church. And so specifically, if you're familiar with this letter, um, and especially once you get to Romans, chapters 12 and on, in Romans, in Romans 14 and 15, you really see this. Paul is writing to a group of Jewish Christians and, and, and Greek Christians that are together in the church. And the reason he writes this letter is they were having problems. They were having trouble doing life together. There was a tension. Because the Jewish Christians looked at the Gentile Christians and said, hey, if you're going to be a part of this, you need to think exactly like we think and you need to behave exactly like we behave. And so there was a problem there. And so Paul picks up his pen and he writes this letter and he, t- he makes this huge argument for how God has, has brought them t- together as one group and that together they are to move forward under the banner of Christ and not let any of these little things get in the way. And, and so it's, this is a really important topic for us to look at when we look at our vision and how God is connecting us together and connecting us to take the message outside of these walls. And here's why this is important. Because as, a, as Christians, I think you've, you've probably ran into this before, the church hasn't done a great job at, at really living this out. Too many churches over the last 2,000 years have done exactly what the church in Rome was doing, even though Paul tells us to be different. And the problem is that we fall into the same trap of where we think, you know, that you either have to believe exactly like I believe or behave exactly like I behave if you're going to belong. It's this idea, if you want to belong, you have to behave, which Paul says, hey, look, this is backwards. We're all lost. We're all a mess. But God has brought us together as one. So this is really important for us, really important. So, if you have your Bibles, let's look here. And we're going to see that, that Paul gives us three ways that God connects us as a church for this vision, okay? Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, let's read together. Otherwise, we'll put the words on the screen behind me. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, first, God connects us together to build Christ-centered relationships. God connects us together to build Christ-centered relationships. That's the first way he connects us to fulfill this vision. Look here at Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. Paul says this. He says that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So Paul is specifically talking here about unity, about putting others first. But specifically, he's talking about when there is conflict or disagreement in the church. And you might hear that and you go, well, hey, Drew, come on, man. This is the church. Don't we all just love each other and sing kumbaya and hang out around fireplaces all the time and just really you know, do life? There's never any conflicts or disagreement. And if you think that, I don't know that you've hung around a whole lot of people for very long, right? The reality is human nature says that there's going to be times when you have disagreements. There's going to be times when you have conflict, even in the church. Just think about your workplace. I guarantee you there's people at work that you just have conflict with, that they might think something about, that, that think something that's different than what you think. You might have disagreement at times. Think about your family. How many of you just love going to that family reunion or Thanksgiving and just know you're going to get along and hug and talk to everybody, right? Yeah, yeah Patrick does for sure. But everybody else, you know, you know that there's just going to be people in your family that you just, you kind of rub each other wrong. And it happens in the church part of our human nature. Let's just be real about it. And so Paul tells us, focus on unity. Realize that this is the way it is. Focus on unity and put others first. Put others first and put yourself second. This is just the reality in the church. And the root of this, as I mentioned earlier, this is what was happening in Rome. The root of this, really, there's two mindsets that drive this. The first one is this, that you have to, in the church, behave to belong. 
There's this idea that you have to exa- act exactly like I act if I'm going to invite you into my relationships, right? And unfortunately, we see this. But, but here's why this has always caused me to scratch my head. Because you, you can't expect somebody who doesn't know Jesus yet, you can't expect somebody who is, has not been walking uh, the, the path of faith to, to know, have it all together. Because by the way, I don't have it all together. I'm going to be willing to bet that most of you don't have it all together yet. And so Paul tells these Roman Jews and these Gentiles, hey, look, guys, man, you guys got to bear with each other. You guys got to bear each other's burdens. If you're strong, bear with those that are weak. You can't expect people to be able to behave like you expect. We're all at a different place on our journey. He also, there's another mindset here that we have to battle, and that's this idea that you and I have to believe exactly the same thing on every single issue if we're going to have a relationship. And so that was really what was, ha- that was one of the big things that was happening in the Roman church. Now, I want to be clear. We're not talking about just random beliefs here. But, you know, Paul isn't talking about essential Christian doctrines. Paul is talking about like non-essential or secondary or tertiary some of you might have never used the word tertiary, but it's like third, right? Third, these, these issues. Now, you might say, well, what is an essential Christian doctrine? So an, esi- an essential Christian doctrine are, are the essential things that separate someone who is a Christian, a follower of Jesus, from somebody who isn't. So an essential Christian doctrine would be, say, the deity of Jesus. We believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. Uh, an essential Christian belief is that, that Jesus really did rise from the dead, that he rose on the third day, that the tomb is still empty, which, by the way, it's still empty, church. It's really good news. It's really good news. An essential Christian belief is, say, that Jesus is coming back. These are essential. The Trinity is an essential Christian belief. So these are the essentials, and Paul isn't talking about these. Paul will tell you that you need to be solid on these, that you need to be unified on these. What Paul is talking about are non-essential Secondary, third, tertiary types ideas. So, uh, or beliefs. You might, and you might wonder, what is that? What's a secondary item? Well, a non-essential item would be, say, should a Christian uh, be allowed to drink a glass of wine or to have a beer or to smoke a cigar? Should a Christian be allowed to have a job that would make them work on Sundays? When should a Christian be baptized? These are non-essential issues. You and I can have, debate these. We can talk about these. So we shouldn't, but we shouldn't, and we shouldn't divide about these. Unfortunately, too many people have divided over the history of the church, over these things. So specifically, Paul is talking about these non-essentials. And, and here's how you tell. If, if you've got your Bible with you, um, or you put your finger on your Bible, flip over one page to the left. If you've got your app, just kick back to Romans chapter 14. You'll see that Paul takes, head, takes on, head on this issue of behavior and belief. And he specifically talks about eating meat that's sacrificed to idols, and drinking wine. And so, just a little snapshot, it's a different culture, but just to give you some context, in the first century, in, in the first century Roman culture, they would have temple sacrifices to the pagan gods. And if the pagan gods didn't eat all the meat that was sacrificed, then they would sell it in the market. And you can imagine there was always a lot of meat left over in the market. <laughs> so, excuse me. So the idea was that really the only time, if you lived in first century Corinth or maybe Rome, about the only time you ever got to eat meat would be at these festivals. And so there's this idea, there was this conflict going on where Christians, the Greeks especially, but, but you know, the Jews ran into this, that they would say, hey, I'm free to go, because I'm free in Christ, to go buy meat in the market and eat it. And Paul would say, hey, you are free because of your faith in Jesus Christ. However, if it causes your brother to stumble, don't do it. Right? It says the same thing about drinking wine. So if, if you are, um, yes, in your Christian freedom, you have the ability to, um, to say, drink a glass of wine or have a beer, whatever it may be, in moderation, right, where it doesn't cause you uh, to, to change and alter your state. However, if it causes your brother or your sister to stumble, don't do it. So Paul's talking about Christian liberty and this idea of if you are strong and, and say you're very strong in your Christian liberty and, you're, and your conscience is very strong, but it, you, you have a brother or sister that it's weak, don't do it. Say no instead. So that's really kind of the, the, the basis that Paul is, the foundation he's building on when we get to Romans 15. And he says, hey, if you are strong in your faith, if you're strong in your relationship with Jesus, 
and you think you can do, and, and, and you feel very strong, but you have a brother who, or sister who is weak, bear with their burdens. Put them first. Be unified. Because when you're unified together, that's when the mission of God can move forward. So that's just a little bit of a foundation that we're building on here. This is the idea that we need to be unified on essentials. Now, I love Augustine, uh, Augustine's quote. Augustine was a 4th century early church leader, and here's what he said about this. He said that in essentials, and, and like we said, those essential Christian ideas and beliefs, we need unity. In non-essentials, we need liberty. And in all things, we need charity. I love that. It just gives us a very clear picture. Be unified on the essentials, and everything else, show liberty and grace. And the reality is that each of us are at a different place on our spiritual journey. And this is why we need to show grace, and this is why we need to bear with each other. Because if I single-handedly picked ten of you out here and stood you up on stage, and we had to vote who was the most spiritual, you really could, we probably don't want to do that anyways, but you really couldn't do it well. Because the truth is, every one of us are further along in different areas. You may have, you know, grew up in a family that really focused on prayer, and you feel like, you know, you've just really grown. But maybe you're, you know, you're not as strong on Bible, you know, Bible reading or memorization or whatever it may be. So I think all of us look different. We're all on different paths in our spiritual journey. We're all in different places of maturity. And so that's why we need to show grace to one another and let our relationships in the church and outside the church with other believers be built on Jesus, not on the way we behave or the minute details that we agree on in belief. Does that make sense, guys, what Paul is saying here? So here, here's what Paul says in verse 3 and 4. He says that our relationships have to be built on the example of Jesus Christ. Paul says this in, in verse 3. He said, For Christ did not please himself, but he put others first. In Romans 15, verse 4, Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through that encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So Paul says, Your foundation has to be Christ. It has to be, be, be Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to get distracted and you're going to get your eyes pulled away. And so when you look at our vision, we're kind of looking at our vision backwards here, but our vision says that our, our focus is to build Christ-centered relationships. The way we do that is we unify together as one. And our foundation is Jesus, who he is, and what he came to do, and what he has connected us to do together. So here's the question for you guys. What are your relationships built on? What are your relationships centered on? I think we all have friendships that say are built on going and watching a game together. Or maybe you, you're a foodie and you try out new restaurants, trendy little cafes, or maybe you go to concerts together. And, but outside of that, you don't talk. Outside of that, there's no real relationship. Those are good relationships, and God's going to use those to connect. But what about your, your, those relationships that are, that are deep, that are growing, that you have in your life, with people in this church, with people in your life group, with other believers? Is relationship centered on Jesus? Or is relationship centered on your political views? Or is it centered on how you look at a certain object or a certain belief system or how you act in a certain way? If it's not centered on Jesus, then you're going to find that you are easily diverted, that you can easily have disruption in your relationships. But when it's centered on Jesus, it doesn't matter what these little things are, you have a, a, a foundation established. Does that make sense, guys? That your relationship is centered. So that's why this is so important for us. So Paul specifically says here that when our relationships are centered on Jesus, God will actually use us in a special way. Look at verses 5 and 6. God says here in verses 5 and 6, He says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, verse 6, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is saying that when we're unified, when we're overlooking the secondary stuff that we may not agree on, but we can, in liberty, show love to each other and grace, that we actually come together with one voice and bring glory to God. And when we are together corporately as one, telling the world that we believe in Jesus and that we're centered on Jesus, it shows that He is the way maker, that Jesus is the difference. And it shows that to the world. In... Um, John chapter 13, the Gospel of John. Jesus and his disciples sit down for a Passover dinner. It's the night Jesus is getting ready to get arrest, is going to be arrested. And so Jesus does the humbling act of washing his disciples' feet. Incredible, incredible act. 
And then after he washes their feet, he looks at them and he gives them this new commandment. And notice what he says. Put the words on the screen. John 13. Jesus says this to his disciples. He's saying this to us. He says that a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also are to love one another. By this, by what? Our love for one another. Our unity. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Don't miss this, church. This is big. This is so big. Jesus said that when you love one another, when you put others first, when you bear with each other's burdens, you're actually showing the world that you're his disciple. You're actually showing the world that Jesus makes a difference. When we have a church of people who look different, who talk different, who believe different things, right? Uh, your political view may, may, your views may be different. Some of the cultural things at home may be different. You have people in all different walks of life. When all of those people come together as one, when all of those people are pulling together as one, God says it brings glory. It brings glory to Him. And it shows the world that you're his followers. And it shows the world that Jesus truly is the difference maker. He's the way maker. So Paul says, connect. Jesus connects us together for, to build Christ-centered relationships. Second, look what he says here, secondly. He says, Jesus connects us to restore hope to our community. That Jesus connects us to restore hope to our community. Look back at verses 7 through 9. Paul says this. He says in verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, the promises that God has given us from the very beginning. And in verse 9, And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. One aspect of our vision is to take hope outward and to restore hope in our community. And when we join together on this mission, we, we can do so because our relationships are centered on Jesus. And one of the ways that we, we, we do this is through, is through help. We, we can restore hope through help. Back, um, you guys might remember, back in 2017, uh, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Harvey just decimated parts of Texas, parts of Florida, parts of the Caribbean. And so if you guys remember um, any of the news reports that came out from those hurricanes, uh, USA Today did a report, and they found that out of all the relief efforts that were made, out of all the people that went and poured in time and money, 80% of the relief efforts were, were um, led by faith-based organizations. Churches, Christian groups, 80%. That is huge. That is so huge. And so this is one of the ways that we restore hope in our community is by stepping in and engaging when there's difficult times. This is how we can restore hope through help. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways. And so this is why at Forefront it's so important that we have partners that align with us on this mission to help people find a way back to God, to give hope to their communities. And that's why I love our relationship with uh, community ministry. I know we have a lot of people here in this, in this room today that just pour their heart out at community ministries and community ministry. And what a great organization. And, you know, I just keep pulling up some of the statistics that we had this year from community ministry. As a church, we donated over 1,500 pounds of food. That's a big number. 1,500 pounds of food as a church to help feed the hungry in our community. We brought in uh, almost 1,200 different school supply items, right, to pack backpacks for kids. We sponsored 75 kids' uh, Christmas gifts this year. And so we were able to really lean in with community ministry and help provide and help support. And so, I mean, what a, what a cool way for us to bring hope in our community. You know, just a few weeks ago, our WOW Life Group uh, put together um, kits for, um, for uh, families in, in Africa and sent dresses for kids, sent um, sanitary kits for, for, the, for women. I mean, we just, God has called us to bring hope and to show people that, that there are people that care. And that's our vision, to restore hope. And I don't, I, you know, and I don't want to stop there. I mean, we can go on and on. Our project service group, putting together blessing bags, serving teachers and first responders, passing out turkeys at Thanksgiving to those who are hungry, helping people when they walk in the door that, that need gas and that need food and all these things. These things are, are things that we can do as a church to help restore hope. But we can't stop there. We can't stop there. People need the good news of Jesus. Bringing hope, restoring hope, 
can begin when we help. But we have to keep moving forward, to keep pushing the needle forward. I like what David Platt says. You guys know David Platt. David Platt says this. He says, the church is God's plan A to reach the world, and there's no plan B. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's true. He's so right. The church is God's plan A for how we're going to change this world. That means you're his plan A. Now, that's kind of scary, right? You might, you might say, well, hey, Drew, I, if I was God, I'd have a much better way of figuring this thing out, right? And I think sometimes we've all probably had those ideas. Like, well, God, I would just do this. I'd just send an airplane with a banner right behind it or smoke signals in the sky or whatever. But God didn't do that. Instead, he's, he's going to send you. I like what Isaiah says. He says that God's ways are higher than our ways. God's much further ahead of us. God knows how this whole thing comes together. He just asks to be, us to be faithful and to step into it. So at Forefront, I wanted us to take this a step further. And that's why we're, we're currently making connections with our local neighborhood association, with our local councilmen, with the local schools, so we can find ways that we can lean in and, and help restore hope. And in that moment, have an open door to talk about what God is doing, not just in this church, but in our lives. So God has called us to this big God-sized vision. And part of it means that we are restoring hope. We want people to know that there are people that care. And we want Forefront to be a beacon of hope in this community. And I think if I went around this room and I asked each of you, do you want to live a life of significance? Do you want to make an impact? I, I think and I hope that all of you would say yes. But one of the challenges is we just wonder, where do we start? Where, where do I start? How do I truly restore hope? How do I make a difference? And this is why verse 13 is so powerful. Look, what, look back. Look back what Paul says in verse 13. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Notice the power in this, that God, through us, funnels hope to this world. That when we connect together as a church in relationship with a vision to take hope outside these walls, God will move through us, help us to abound in that hope so that others can abound in that hope. Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that he came so that we may have life and have it in abundance. Part of that abundant life, church, is sharing hope with others. Amen? Amen. That's part of it. So where do we start? I don't have time to spend much, on, much time on this, but I, I love what John Maxwell says. John Maxwell is one of the, the foremost uh, authors on, le on um, leadership. And he says this, if you want to lead a, lead a life of significance, if you want to make a difference, then there's five things you need to do every day. So write these down. We'll, we'll, hit them, we'll hit them heavy later. Five things you can do every day. First thing is this, value people. Value people. He says, change how you view people. Don't see people as projects. Don't see the homeless or the hungry or the people outside these doors as projects. No, value them. See them as image, bearer of, image bearers of God. These are men and women that God has created, that God loves so much. He's sending you to go tell them. So value people. Secondly, he says, think of ways to add value to people. This means that when we are just kind of in our idle time, that we're actually thinking of things that we can do to add value to people's lives, to help restore hope, to be attentive right? To be thoughtful. Number three, look for ways to add value when you're with people. So don't just sit at home and write in your little moleskin journal how you want to help people. Like step in. And when you're out, do something to help people. Look for ways to add value. Four, ask yourself at the close of every day, did I add value to someone's life? When, I, when you get home and lay your head down tonight and tomorrow night and the next night, ask yourself, did I add value to somebody? It could be as simple as opening the door for somebody. It could have been as, as simple as giving somebody a hot meal. Did I add value to somebody's life? And number five, and this is key if we're going to connect this community with hope. Number five, it says, encourage others to add value to people. So as we're having conversations with each other, as we're doing life together, are we asking each other, hey... How'd you add value this week? What can we do to add value? Look for ways to add value. Encourage others to add value. We could spend an hour on this, but this is just the idea that God wants us to restore hope in his community, and he, and he doesn't want us just to expect somebody else to do it. He's asking us to do it, to join together on that mission together. So God connects us to build Christ in relationships. God connects us to restore hope in our community. And third, we're going to close with this one. God connects us to take the life-changing message of Jesus to those who don't know him. 
God connects us for this purpose. He doesn't send you out on your own to be some, um, some you know, way, wayfaring stranger. He connects us together as a church, built on him, focused on restoring hope, to take this message outside these walls. Look back at verses 18 through 21. Here's what Paul says. He closes with this. He says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except that Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Paul says, hey, it's not me, it's God, it's God's Spirit that's given me the power to take the gospel out, and I'm not going to talk about anything else other than taking the gospel to those that need to hear it. He says um, in verse 20, and thus I make my ambition, Paul's passion, is to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. It's a big chunk, but here's what Paul says. He says that my goal is to take this message that God has given me, that he's connected me to the church, and told me to take out, to take it to people who haven't heard, to take it to people who don't know. And so Paul's passion was for the unchurched, for the people that didn't know about Jesus and specifically building relationships with them, connecting them with a relationship with Jesus. So I think one of the questions for us to consider is, is your life, is this church, is your life group, is your family, or your ministry, is this a safe place for people who don't know Jesus? Is this a safe place for those who never had a relationship with Christ? or fell out of a relationship with church because of some, you know, some issue when they were young and never came back. Is this going to be an open place? Is your, are you going to be an open book? You know, I was talking with a guy a couple weeks ago, and really nice guy. Uh, we were just talking about, um, he, he had a saturated hanger on his door, and he sent me an email, and we met and had coffee and talked and, and prayed. And he had, he had uh, been part of a church for a long time and then has, has, has kind of fallen away and hasn't found a church that he feels at home yet. And we were talking about Forefront, and we were just talking about what God is doing and, and, and how God is faithful. And he asked me this question. He said, would I be welcomed in your church? And like my heart kind of sank, you know, when he said that. I'm like, absolutely, you'd be welcome here. But... It, it's tough to hear that because that means that there's churches out there that aren't welcoming, that people walk into and they're not going to feel welcome. Church, is this a place that you can walk into and feel welcome? I pray it is. If it's not, we better make it one, right? We, we better make it one. That's, that's so critical. So when you walk in, when you walked in today and you hang out in the lobby and you see somebody you don't know, go talk to them. When you sit down in your row and you see somebody that you're not familiar with, go sit next to them. We have to help people see that they're welcome here, that this is a safe place to come and to ask questions and get to know Jesus so that we can show Jesus. You know, statistics show that people have between four, between four and eight seconds people make their first impression of you. So somebody walks in and we don't say a word to them, four to eight, eight seconds they're already thinking, this isn't a very welcoming place. That's not much time. But because it's not much time, we better get it right. Amen, church? We've got to get this right. We got to get this right. So we have this big vision God has given us. We have this mission that He's called us in together. So we have to ask this question: Are we like Paul? Are we bent towards people that don't know Jesus? Is our focus in our heart to help connect people to God? And you might say, "Well, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure even what to do. I don't even know where to start." But it starts with the hard attitude that says, hey, I may not know the words to say, but I know who to invite, where to invite them to. Or I know somebody to introduce them to. And with the attitude that says, I'm, but I'm going to let that tension drive me to learn what to say. See, if you look at Paul's life, he was very strategic on how he took the gospel. Paul would go into the city center. He would talk about Jesus. He'd go into the synagogue. He'd get kicked out of the synagogue, get threatened to get arrested, go to somebody's house, start a house church. He always had the same strategy, but he never told the gospel the same way twice. You know, Paul would go to Mars Hill and talk to philosophers, and he'd talk about Aristotle and Plato. Plato. I mean, he would use philosophers' own words to reach these people. Then he would tell them about Jesus. Paul would walk into a synagogue, and he'd use the Old Testament scriptures to point to Jesus, and then he would tell them about Jesus. And so it's the idea that we, we don't have to know exactly what to say. We just trust that God's going to open the door and be faithful to step into it. So, 
Next, um, next week, we're going to spend time talking about our strategy as a church. And then after that, we're going to do a six-week series called I Love My Church. Invite somebody to that. Come back for that. It's going to be really cool. I'm excited about that. One of the things we're going to talk about, though, in this new series is how to share our faith. We're going to actually do some, have some fun with this. Talk about how we start these conversations. But in the meantime, I want to leave you with a couple resources. Put some tools in your hands. The first one is this. If, and the easy little apps to download on your phone uh, or your tablet, whatever it is. The first one is this. It's the Three Circles app. You can just go, to, just, just go to the App Store or Google Play and type in Life Conversation Guide and you can pull up this app and it is literally as simple as pushing, is swiping your screen that will walk you through simple ways to talk about Jesus. Life conversation guide, three circles. The second one, super simple, it's life in six words. And, and what's funny is, it, you say, well, I don't know if I'm going to feel comfortable. Oh, pulling my phone out and just talking to somebody about it. Statistics show that over nine out of, nine out, more than nine out of ten people, if you have a relationship with them, are open to talking about their faith. Nine out of ten. So you guys have an open door for this. Just pull out your phone. You, know, you can have your friend even fill it out. And it'll walk you through how to talk about Jesus. And we'll spend more time talking about this as we come. But here's the idea. Just be intentional to look for open doors. To help look for opportunities to point people to Jesus. And this is, this is really important for us. Because like I said last week, God has given us a God-sized mission. He has given us a God-sized vision. And He has just called us to connect together to use our relationships to connect others, to use our relationships to connect hope in this community. And we do this by living intentionally. So here's my prayer. I want to close with this. Here's my prayer for us. That each of you will take time this week to slow down, to mute some of the noises, and to think about the relationships that God has placed you in. To think about the, your workplace, maybe it's your neighborhood, maybe it's your kids, you know, your, your kids' soccer team, whatever it is. Think about those relationships that God has placed you in. And there's three questions I want you to ask. We'll tweet these out, but you can write these down if, if you have time. Here's our three questions. Who do I know that I can invite into a deeper relationship with Jesus? Who do I know that I can, I can build and deepen and grow a relationship that's Christ-centered? Is somebody in this church, is somebody in your life group, who do I know that's my neighbor? Who, who is it that I can go and I can invite into a deeper relationship? Secondly is this. Who do I know that I can add value to? Who can I help restore hope to? Who can I lean into this week and next week? Who do I know? We all know somebody. We all do. We all know that family that's struggling through a situation. Let's lean in. And finally, third question to write down, to consider. Who can I introduce to Jesus this week. This is the mission and the vision God has called us to. It's a big, God-sized, beautiful vision. But he promises to be with us as we walk through it. And he says, as you go, we talked about last week, his presence will be with us. His authority goes before us. And we know that when we do it together, God has connected us for a purpose. Let's pray together.